thanks again, guys. I appreciate the um, introduction. I'll try to keep this. I, I don't know how much time I have here, but we can make this as long or as short as we want to. So if you need to push me or stop me, just let me know, but I'll, I'll run through this. We we're basically a CPA firm that caters to entrepreneurs and investors with a really heavy focus on proactive tax planning. That's where we get the um, biggest value for our clients. And it just so happens we have a lot of clients in the real estate space. I have money there. I've got investments in a few hundred doors myself passively. And we manage the tax work and um, accounting work for, I, I don't know how many thousands of doors and a lot of syndication groups. So we've got a lot of experience in this. I've been doing this for 20 plus years. Um, I know it well. So um, that's kind of where we uh, come from. We've, we're based out of Dallas, Texas, Irving to be specific. And this little graphic here shows kind of what we do for our clients. So it's not just about me and the tax situation. We, we have a lot of relationships that I've built over my 20 plus year career from putting clients into places with people they trust like bankers and attorneys and insurance agents, but also investors and groups like yourself. So that when I have a client that's looking to deploy assets, I don't want to put them with anybody when I want to make sure that the people that they're working with is that are top notch. So we work hard to be everything for our family. This is this is my family right here. This is just a little background on who I am. I uh, married with a, a blended family. We've got kids all the way from first grade to um, college. So that's my my people right there. That's why I do all of this stuff. But yeah, they they are my wonderful tax deductions. And we'll kind of explain a little bit about hiring your kids and how you can do that. But um, this, this is what I'm most proud of in my career, what I'm most proud of for what we do for our clients. $26 million in income taxes is what I've been able to save our clients in the last four years. And the number one way we do that is being proactive. And, and I'll tell all my new clients, all my existing clients, there's a lot I can do for you on, what is today, October 19th? There's a lot I can do for your 2022 tax return today that I won't be able to do next year in April, looking back. So where we differentiate ourselves as a firm, where we are do a lot of things that maybe traditional firms don't do is we look into the future. And if you want to save money on your taxes, if you come out of here with anything today, that's the number one thing you need to do is be proactive. It's not always fun to deal with your taxes and worry about it, but you can save a lot of money. And I'll illustrate that later. But We've saved our clients $26 million, and, and that can be as little as a few thousand dollars for some clients. It can be big $6 figures for um, six-digit uh, figures for some of the clients, and, and real estate's a big asset of, of a lot of that, a big caveat of a lot of that. So what we really do is simplify the tax code down for our clients and, and put it in easy to understand topics and really educate them. The more I can explain about how the tax code works for my clients, uh, the better investors you're gonna be, the more money you're gonna make and, and turn around and, and give more business uh, for us. So one of the big things you need to understand is the tax code is really geared toward doing things for the government. So if you've got a business if you create jobs, the government likes jobs. Politicians love to point to job growth when they're trying to get elected. Well, with that, if you look at that, if you've got a business and you employ people, you're going to get a lot of tax breaks from deductions to um, tax credits if you hire a certain demographic of people. Everybody knows about the PPP loans and now the ERC credits that are going out there. There's a lot of benefits to having employees. The government likes it. They're going to scratch your back. And they're going to give you a lot of deductions. On the same side, we're talking about real estate today. If you provide housing for, uh, for 
uh, tenants. The government doesn't do that, but they want that. They want good quality housing for those people. Let's say you've got a, what's this Houston thing? You said 148 doors in Houston. That 148 doors, if it's fully occupied, it's putting 148 taxpayers or 188 taxpaying families to deploy. The IRS is going to have those people paying them taxes via their W-2 in turn to provide a, a good um, benefit for the um, government. The IRS is going to give the real estate investor and the landlord big cost segregation, depreciation deductions. They're going to give them favorable treatment on a lot of different things. So there's a lot of things businesses can do that the W-2 employee um, can't. And one of the things that really irks me is when it's tax time and or it's uh, re-election time and a lot of people start complaining that only the, the big dogs get the tax breaks, the rich get the tax breaks. Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk pay less taxes than, than anyone else. They get to deduct all this money. Warren Buffett's secretary has a higher rate than he does. Well, you know what? We're all playing off the same set of rules. The Internal Revenue Code is not written any differently for those guys than it is for you. You just have to know how to make the facts work in your favor so you can reduce down your tax burden. And you need to work with an advisor, a CPA that understands that works that for you. And that's what we do. So to really jump into the meat of this and, and all the real estate, I wanna illustrate how taxes really do affect your returns. So I've got a couple of slides here and I wanna throw out some um, returns that you would see. So let's take a, uh, an example of $10,000 investment. Let's say I come to you today and I say, if you give me $10,000, I'm gonna put you in an asset that's gonna return 10% per year and you're in a 37% bracket, at the end of 30 years, you're going to have $62,000. It's going to be 82 in growth and about 30K in taxes. So you're going to turn 10K into 62K in 30 years. That's a, that's a decent growth on your money. But let's see what you can do if you pay 0% in taxes. Same fact scenario, 10 10K now, 10% return each year, no taxes you're gonna turn that same uh, 10,000 into $174,000. And you might say, well, there's nothing I can put my money that I'm not going to be exposed to taxes. That's not true. I can show you through real estate how we can 1031 your way there the whole way, how we can gift that to your estate, how your estate can give it to your heirs tax-free. There are certainly ways you can invest in real estate and pay a 0% tax bracket. And a lot of people have done it. Let's compound that even further. One of the real beauties of real estate is leverage. So let's say in the same example, we take the same $10,000 and make it a 20% down payment on a, a $50,000 asset. So you put 10 in cash down, you borrow 40. We're in a 37% bracket. We're getting 10% return. You're going to pay 5% on that original 40K note. You can see that difference is astronomical. And that's what real estate does for you. It leverages that asset. So instead of having $10,000 working for you, you got $50,000 working for you. And because your 10% return was greater than your debt, you've expounded that over the course of the life of the asset. This is really what real estate does for you. So as you can see, the three different examples there. The first example, that tax really does knock your return down to less than a 10% return. It's closer to 6%. The middle rate gets you a little bit above seven and then the leveraged asset obviously knocks it out of the park. So those, that is what real estate can do for you. So again, why does the government reward real estate? Why do you have so many favorable things? They do a lot that, that, they can't do. We're, we're not a communist society, so we don't have privatized housing. It's all going through investors and landlords. So if you invest in multifamily and you provide a, um, an apartment that's where people want to live in a good area, well, those people are going to work. They're going to have jobs. 
and they're going to pay a lot of taxes to the IRS. And that, the IRS is going to get their money out of the taxpayers that way. So in turn, they're going to stretch landlords back and give them a lot of breaks. If you've got a business, if you've got a commercial office building that houses a lot of different build, uh, a lot of different businesses, those businesses are going to be profitable. They're going to have employees that are on W-2 jobs. Those businesses are going to pay income taxes. The IRS is going to reward the landlord with all sorts of depreciation breaks. And we can go on and on with schools and, and health care. So if, if you're doing something that benefits the uh, government, you're going to have, find a tax break for it. So what are some of those favorable tax treatments? Well, first off, you get favorable long-term capital gains rates. So if you hold an asset, real estate, stock, any sort of capital asset for a year or longer, your tax rate on that gain, the difference between what you sell it for and your beginning basis less depreciation, is going to be 20% of its highest amount, as low down to 0% if you're in a certain tax bracket. So you've got lower rates on that than it had you have had that money in ordinary income taxed at 37%. Depreciation, cost segregation studies, bonus depreciation, that is the, um, that's the stellar thing in real estate right now. If, if you guys don't know what cost segregation is, um, you need to learn a little bit about it, but basically what it allows you to do is take a lot of depreciation out of an asset in the first year. And the reason that's been such a, a big hit, a cost segregation studies have been around for a long time, and I won't go into detail about it unless you guys need me to, but cost segregation studies have been around a long time. The thing that really helped uh, propel this was in 2018, when Trump and uh, the Republicans changed the rules on bonus depreciation for any assets that had a 15-year life or less to be eligible for bonus depreciation, which means that 15-year assets, 10, 7, and 5-year assets were subject to 100% bonus depreciation in the year they're placed in service. Those rules are changing at the end of the year and they're going to sunset. So as you see down there, they're gonna phase down to 80% next year, beginning on January 20, uh, January 1st. They're gonna go down to 60% in 24, 40 and 25, and all the way down to zero in 2027, unless the rules are changed. But as it stands right now, that's where we sit. So. I put a little graphic down here to kind of illustrate what that means, bottom line for you. So let's say you had a million dollar asset. Let's say you uh, bought in a piece of real estate that was worth a million dollars. You did a cost segregation study on it. We could reasonably estimate that you're probably going to get a $225,000 depreciation under today's 100% bonus rules. If you're in the 37% tax bracket, a $225,000 deduction is going to save you $83,000. So we can look at 2023 and 24 and 25 as those uh, bonus depreciation sunsets down, how that lowers your amount. Still, even when we get down to 40%, it's still saving you 33K on that. So even when we go down to zero, cost segregations will still be a, um, a good play. It won't be quite the home run grand slam that it is right now, but it'll still save you quite a little bit of money. It's a big player in depreciation and in real estate. More things you can do in real estate are 1031 exchanges. That's basically where you can trade uh, property. You sell one property, and if you have a deferred gain, uh, capital gain on it, you can exchange that in, to buy a new piece of property and you pay no capital gains on that exchange as long as you uh, buy property for at least what you sold the old property for. You've got conservation easements. This is kind of a red flag with the IRS, but it's, it's available out there. Basically, if you have land and you conserve it, 
meaning that you won't build anything else on that vacant land, the IRS will give you a tax deduction, a charitable contribution on the difference between the fair market value if you either developed on that land versus what you bought it for, or if you conserved, say, the um, minerals on it. Like, let's say you had mineral rights or trees or timber and you can serve that asset that you were no longer going to take the timber or the resources off that land you could take the valuation of what that would be in today's market versus what you bought it for and get a big tax deduction for it it's fallen out of favor with the irs because some of those valuations have been uh, grossly misstated but if you do it right it's still a, it's still a great play you just have to have your t's crossed and i's dotted Opportunity zones, that's where you, if you have a capital gain outside of real estate, say in the stock market, you can buy into an opportunity zone, develop that land and, and defer, some cap, um, defer some of your capital gains. You can use self-directed IRAs to invest into real estate. I'll, um, I'll always say you got to be aware of, of UBIT and UDFI if you're doing that, but if you do it right, it can still be a good way to deploy your assets in something that's not going to tank like the stock market is right now. And then obviously, we all know uh, real estate's got great passive income where you don't have to do very much, but you can generate some cash flow from that. So that's just a few list of what the tax, favorable tax treatments are. Here's the one thing I really wanted to illustrate to a lot of you. And that's that real estate is a tax shelter. And that might sound like a bad thing or a negative term, but what you need to understand is all of these favorable rules that um, are afforded to real estate investors and landlord, the IRS knows about it. So they have rules in place, these passive rules to limit what you can deduct. So here's how I want to explain this, because a lot of you on here are probably passive investors or, or LPs, and you're not the GPs. So let's say you're an LP. You just give your money into an investment, and that's all you really do. You're not boots on the ground. Well, that's going to be a passive investment for you. So when you're looking at your tax return, you've really got three areas of income. You've got active income, which is your W-2 income, or if you're in a business and you have, um, you're actively involved in a business and day-to-day -day operation. You got portfolio income, which is your interest, your dividends, your capital gains in the stock market. Then you got passive income. Passive income is from businesses that you are not actively involved in, and it is also real estate. The reason those three, those three types of income are important are because you, when you have a loss in a passive activity, which real estate is passive in nature, you cannot offset those passive losses against your active income. In other words, if you're a passive investor and you give 100K into a multifamily deal and the next year you get a K-1 for an $80,000 loss, if that's a passive loss and, and you've got W-2 income, you can't offset those two. You just, you can't do it based on the rules. So what happens if you have a passive loss? Well, it's not gone away. You don't lose it entirely. It's just suspended and it's carried forward into the future until one of two things happen. Either you have passive income or you, the asset that had the passive loss is disposed of or sold. So those passive losses never go away. They're just suspended and carried forward in the future. Um, and then the, the $25,000 active investment is, is for, if you make less than 150K in, in um, income, as long as you're actively involved in real estate, say, meaning like, let's say you've got some single family houses that you manage, um, and you've got some losses, you can put up to, you can deduct up to $25,000 in losses against that as long as you're actively involved. Okay, so 
basically you understand a little bit about the passive rules. How do you make real estate not passive? How do we get those losses to offset against your W-2 income or your other big income? How do you pay zero dollars in taxes? Well, from a real estate perspective, you've got to turn these losses into from passive to non-passive. And the way you do that is you have to be a real estate professional. And this graph here kind of illustrate what it does. And section 469 is the code section that outlines all the passive activities. But here's the three rules you need to know if you want to try to become a real estate professional. Step one, you have to spend more than 50% of your personal service time in real estate. What that means in layman terms is I'm a CPA. I've got a practice as a CPA. If I work 40 hours a week in my CPA practice, I would love it. I don't. I work more than that. My wife will attest to that. But let's say I did work a 40 hour a week. I would have to spend more than 40 hours working in real estate to cover that first 50% personal service time test. For me, it's not going to happen. It's just physically impossible. So if you have um, an activity where you're in a full-time job, you're not going to get past step one. But let's say you can, or let's say you have a spouse that isn't working, that that's not an issue. Because if your spouse is a real estate professional, or the, the, the main taxpayer is a, a real estate professional, all of that's lumped together on the same tax return, you can offset the other's income. But um, let's say you pass step one and you get the 50% rule. Second step is you gotta spend more at least 750 hours a year in real estate. What that means is 15 to 20 hours a week have to be, um, used in real estate, meaning that you're, if you're a syndication group, maybe you're managing a multifamily project, maybe you're raising capital, maybe you're working with lenders, maybe you're working with attorneys, maybe you're underwriting deals. There's a variety of things you can do to get to that 750 hour mark. So once you meet that, the third step is material participation. And material participation, basically what that says and I won't make you read all of this, but basically what material participation says is for each rental activity you have, you are spending at least 100 more hours than anyone else on there, or at least 500 hours. And each real estate asset that you own is uh, looked at separately from material participation. So let's say you are a GP on four or five deals and you've got a couple of single families. Well, you've got to materially participate, spend at least 500 hours on each one of those, unless you make an election to group all of your real estate into one single activity. Because let's say if you had four or five K1 GP investments and then you've got some single families, there's not enough hours in the year to get to 500 apiece. So the IRS will let you group all of your activities into one asset class for um, tax purposes, and then you can get your material participation hours in that way. And material participation hours and the 750 hours are all the same thing. So if you're spending at least 750 hours a year in real estate and you're materially participating, you've probably met most of those. So that's, that's kind of the quick and dirty on that. So let's say if you weren't a real estate professional and you're just an LP, what happens to those losses? Well, I want to give you kind of a, a quick story on a $122,000 mistake we just got done fixing for one of our clients just last week. These, this form on your tax return, the 8582 is super important. You as an investor, if you are investing in real estate, I want you to know what this form does and I want you to know what to look for because guess what? Even CPAs miss this. Um, not us, but other CPAs, they'll, they'll miss it on you. So what the passive activity loss limitation form, form 8582 does, is it carries those suspended losses forward. So if you, get a, if you invest 100K into a deal 
you get a K-1 for an $80,000 loss, and that's passive. You don't lose that. It's just going to go to Form 8582. It's going to go to the second page that I have highlighted there on the left, Part, uh, part 7, Allocation of Unallowed Losses. And it's going to carry forward indefinitely until one of two things happen. Either you have enough passive income to offset that in the future, or that asset that created the passive loss is sold. At that time, those passive losses will magically release and be offset against your ordinary income. Here's why it's important to see this. On the right, I, I've got a client that had a $122,000 mistake that another firm did. So, so here's the facts of the situation. I've got a client that sold a piece of real estate and had a million dollar capital gain. We did some tax planning for him last year and said, you're not going to have any sort of issues with this. You got enough passive losses carrying forward. Um, you've got some other losses coming in for some other deals. You shouldn't have an issue. Well, my team went together and got to work on this tax return. And on the bottom here on to the 2020 8582, we only saw $50,000 of uh, losses carrying forward. Well, the 2020 tax return was prepared by another CPA. Before that, the 2019 return was prepared by another CPA firm. And now in 2021, he's come to us to finally get all this mess undone. But basically what happened in 2019 he had $611,000 of passive losses that were suspended. They weren't used. When he switched firms from 2019 to 2020 and went to a new firm who was supposedly a real estate uh, firm, I, I know who did this, they didn't pick up this passive loss carry forward of $611,000. And it wasn't picked up because the client wasn't aware of it. They're not really sure of that. The CPA didn't catch it because they were probably busy. And because this is passive and it doesn't affect ordinary income, it doesn't really send off a red flag to, to, to anyone. But it did to us in 2021 when I've got a million dollar capital gain being taxed at 20%, creating a $200,000 tax liability. We start digging into this and see that those losses weren't carried forward. So what we're going to have to go do is go amend their 2020 tax return to get that loss to carry forward. And once we do that, those losses will be unallowed. Uh, allowed. And that 611, if we multiply that by 20% 20, 20 of a long-term capital gains rate, saved him $122,318. That's a huge savings. And it's a simple mistake, but it's an easy mistake to make. So look at your form 8582. Go, go back and look at your tax returns if you've been investing in real estate and look at that stuff from year to year, because once those losses are gone, they're gone. Let's say, for example, in this situation, my client had 611000 in 2019. Had he have sold this asset not in 2021, but let's say he sold it in 2023, well, my statute of limit, limitations to go back and change this return may have been up and there's nothing I could have done and he would just be SOL. So look at that stuff. Make sure the CPA you're working with is looking at that stuff and understands that stuff because it's a big deal. Hey, Ben, right. can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Um, can you go back? Okay, so... So the six hundred and eleven thousand is not like a direct, uh, it's not a one for one depreciation, right? You only get twenty percent of that. Yes. Yeah. Can you? I don't really understand that part. Well, it's it's passive loss limitation. So kind of going back here, I'm telling you, when you have passive losses. You cannot offset those passive losses against your active income. So when my client earned these losses um, in the years that he earned it, all of these were treated as passive. So they're carried forward in the future indefinitely as passive losses. And as I said before, the only way to unlock passive losses is to have passive income. 
or the assets are sold. Well, they're unlocked in 2021 because my client had a million dollar capital gain that was passive income. So I had a million dollars of passive income that I could offset against that um, $611,000 passive loss. So these losses were generated through operational stuff and most likely depreciation. So he had a big, big uh, depreciation loss on that in those years that carried forward, but it just wasn't carried forward from year to year. Does that make sense? Um, so it's the 20% though, like it, because it's a long-term loss, long-term. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, so your long-term capital gains rates in this situation, my client had a million dollar capital gain. Ordinarily, that million dollar capital gain is going to be taxed at 20% because in his case, it was long term. He held it for a year longer. Because he had these passive loss carry forwards carrying forward, when he had the million dollars of passive income, I can finally net those two together. So he pays on the difference between those. So his, his tax ended up being significantly less than. Um, 200K, it was somewhere in the range of, I don't know, 50 or 60 on that particular asset. But again, these are, these are deductions. It's not a tax credit, it's a deduction. Okay, got it, thank you. I actually just got a question as well here. So the question I have is, are you able to use any of the deductions um, if you were to use some sort of tax account to invest in real estate? Or is that something that you're not able to use at all? Well, again, the, the, the nature of these losses, if, if we can get you to become a real estate professional, then that's going to unlock a lot of things for you. And, and to become a real estate professional, that's where I was talking about your 50% service time in real estate, your 750 hours and your material participation. If you meet those criteria, then any losses that you have in real estate are going to offset any active income. And there's a myriad of ways to do it. So let's say you're married and let's say you're on a full-time job but your spouse has the availability through time to meet the 50% rule, to meet the 750 hours and to meet the material participation. Well, if your spouse is a real estate professional, they can all set all of their losses against your active income if you're filing a joint tax return. So that, that's one way to do it. Um, and we'll kind of walk through. I've got a couple of tax planning situations that I, I can show. Yeah, let's today. keep let's keep going through the slide. And uh, please, everybody, if you have questions, submit them through the chat box, and I will take them all uh, at the end here. Sure. Yeah. Well, I hit through this pretty quick. It's um, strategies for exit. Obviously, you get a few different strategies for exit when you when you do have capital gains. Um, obviously you're taxed on the difference between what the asset is sold for real estate, less what you bought it for, less depreciation. So there's something called depreciation recapture. And what that means is when you have depreciation on an asset that just lowers down your basis. So let's say I have a piece of real estate for hundred K I take 50 K in depreciation. My tax basis is now 50. Anything above $50,000 I sell it for, I'll pay tax on, not the original 100 I have. So a lot of things you can do to prepare for exits, one, are to be proactive and talk to an advisor that can kind of give you an idea of what you're looking at tax-wise. But 1031s are available for you if you've got real estate on your own. It's a little harder in a syndication group because it's hard to get um, multiple people to want to uh, 1031 that asset because it's the actual entity that has to do the 1031, not each individual investor, unless you have a tenant and common structure, but I'm not going to uh, get into all of that. Uh, you can stagger your investments. So if you, 
as, as I was just saying here, he's, he's got staggered investments somewhat. He's got a million dollars in uh, capital gains. He's got $611,000 from investments that he's put into previously. That offset his uh, income. Um, you can sell off things that are losing money in the stock market for you. So if you have a capital loss in the stock market and you've got a capital gain from real estate, those two will mesh into each other. Um, or you can consider short-term rentals. Um, those are treated in the tax code a little bit differently than straight real estate. You don't have to be a real estate professional if you meet some rules. So there's all sorts of things you can do to strategize for an exit. But let me walk you through a couple of case studies and then I'll try to answer some questions for you. So again, uh, getting back to what I said originally, the biggest thing you can do to tax plan for yourself is to be proactive and work with an advisor that can help you look at this stuff. So I'm going to give you a couple of cases. This first case is a uh, young person that was making $150,000 on a W-2. And three years ago, they invested $75,000 into an apartment complex, a multifamily deal. And it sold this year for $125,000. They had suspended passive losses of $60,000. And they were contemplating putting 75 k into a new deal, but they were worried about their tax structure, so they didn't know what they were doing. So I'll give you three options. One, this client did this return on their own via TurboTax and they ended up paying $43,000 in tax because they did not take the suspended passive losses of 60K. That's, um, that's a no-brainer. That's what I was just showing you earlier. Form 8582, uh, part seven, worksheet five, know it, use it, love it. So if he did it on his own, he, he paid $43,000 because he missed the 8582. Well, let's say... He didn't have a, a plan, but he did pick up the passive losses that can offset against those capital gains of 110. His tax bill comes down to $29,000. So just by picking up that capital gain, that passive loss there, he's going to save himself about 14K in taxes. Well, let's say he did some planning and came to us and we were able to work out what his tax bill would be one way versus the other. We could have told him to reinvest that $75,000 he wanted to, which is going to create more losses for himself that he can use. Because as we see, we've got passive capital gains of 110. We've got suspended passive losses of 60. And we've got more um, passive losses here, 50. That gain is totally offset, takes him down to a $17,000 tax bill. So you know, he can go from 43 to 17 real pretty, really quick just by knowing what his tax plan would be, knowing what his tax situation would be for that. And that's a $25,000 difference, folks. So if you want to see the advantage of, of this, $25,000. Yeah. And that's, um, that's kind of routine of, of what we do every day. And, and, and that is pretty simple. But Let's give you another example. And this is kind of more in line of, of a lot of what we do. So here's the fact pattern. We've got a client that's married with two kids. Two kids, Jared, that's, that's cake. We can do that in our sleep. All right, two kids that are 11 and 17. They've got a uh, wife makes 100K on a uh, W-2 from a tech job. A uh, husband makes 100K and he's self-employed from an IT consulting company. So key, neither one of these guys are real estate professionals. Um, the husband makes $200,000 from his IT consulting company. Let's say over the pandemic, they went crazy on Chip and Joanna on HGTV and figured out they could flip a house and, and went in there and, and uh, made $100,000 in 11 months on flipping a house. Let's say they also invested $100,000 with you guys in Crown Capital and got a $75,000 loss on a K-1. What's his tax return look like? Well, if he comes to me in April with these same fact patterns for the last year, he's going to pay $138,000 in tax. 
He's going to pay about 22K in payroll taxes. He's going to pay self-employment taxes on his IT consulting business. His ordinary income taxes are 106. I'm not even factoring in state taxes because I take that as we live in Texas, so it doesn't come into play. But for those of you that are in high income, uh, high tax states, that's another thing that sh should take into consideration. 138 cases tax bill. If he comes to me in April to do his tax return for last year, if he comes to me now and we take the same fact pattern, I can get him from a $138,000 tax bill down to a $50,000 tax bill, saving him almost $88,000. And we're going to do that through a variety of things. First off, we're going to hire those kids. Tax code says that um, if uh, we employ our children in the business and they're doing actual work that's indicative of the wage they're paid, I can move $12,000 out of his high 30, 32% tax bracket into the kid's 0% tax bracket. He can use that money to pay for their Roth IRA. He can use it to pay for their education or put it into a 529 plan. He can do a lot of different things for it. Uh, we're going to reduce down the husband's wages. He was paying almost a 100K, create about a $22,000 payroll tax bill. I can bring that down a little bit and still have it deemed as reasonable compensation and save him about 7K in taxes. We can set up a medical expense reimbursement plan through its company and deduct some medical expenses that we're getting sorted out through itemized deductions. We can change his business from a single member LLC into an S Corp, set up a new management company. I can have him suggest that he 1031s that Chip and Joanna flip. We can set up this company so that his wife is a part of the company therefore taking some of these passive income because she's not materially participating in her company, which would open up the crown capital losses that she's getting, have them invest into an IRA, yada, 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 so on and so forth. This is kind of the bread and butter of what we really do for our clients. And I'm whipping through this really quick and I'm not giving you all the details on this, but everything that I'm explaining here if an auditor came in tomorrow um, for the IRS and wanted to challenge this, we've got everything, every tax code we can back up to this. The biggest difference between this $138,000 tax bill and this $50,000 tax bill is just planning. It, it's being proactive with your tax bill and not reactive. This client came to us he knew he, he felt like he was paying a little too much, and he absolutely was. And we took the same facts. He's still making $500,000 in no plan, $500,000 after the plan. He's just got more money in his pocket. So all in all, that's, that's a lot of what we do. So is are there anything that I can clarify or share with you guys? Yeah, that's great. I know we have some questions coming up. First, we're going to take a picture. So if anybody who wants to be in a picture, you could be on camera or uh, smile. And if not, that's okay. Uh, you don't have to be. But uh, Tiffany, you want to get the picture in real quick? In 10 seconds, maybe? Yeah, Vince, can you um, stop the screen share, please? Okay. So we can get a photo. Thank you. All right, thank you guys. We always want to take, get the picture. <laughs> put your right. questions in the box, please. One, two, three. And we have page two. So hold on. Where's mm -hmm. the... And there we go. Thank you guys for the those on the camera. And so Lupe. Um, before we do the questions, Lupe, you're going to pull up your screen. You wanted to share one information about how to rack up those passive losses and an opportunity that that's immediate. And then I know we have at least four or five questions in the box already. So please stay with us. Lupe, you're on mute. Lupe? All right. Can you all yeah, see? Yeah, there you go. Okay. 
All right. So after you heard all the tax benefit from Vince, so there's a opportunity for you to do some tax planning this year. Um, you still have a couple months. So we have an offering right now. Um, it's gonna give you um the the cost segregation benefit that Vance speaks about. Um, so in the waterway portfolio currently, um, as you know, this is gonna be the last year of the 100% bonus depreciation. Um, and then, um, so for for example, for 100K investment, uh, we are looking at a minimum of 50% um, tax depreciation or paper loss. Um, for the first year through cost segregation and bonus depreciation. So this ties into a lot of the other strategies uh, Vince was speaking about. So if you like to get more info or interested, just reach out to us. And also the portal link is in the um, chat. Um, so this is, uh, this is what we have right now and uh, feel free to. Great. And there's returns yeah. on top of that passive losses. So I've got a couple of questions. I'm sorry if I'm out of order. Um, Shane, you asked the same question. I was thinking, can my three-year-old be hired to bring me coffee and Cheerios or, or what's a legit age to start employing your kids and what are some types of activities, particularly for those that are under 18 maybe? Yeah. Well, first off, we gotta assume you're, but the tax code has, uh, Court cases going back to seven years old of uh, legally working kids. So three-year-old's going to be a stretch. You probably wouldn't hear me advising that. Um, can they bring you coffee and don't say you do whatever they want to for it. But again, it's got to be a reasonable wage. In other words, I can't bring my 14-year-old um, eighth grader in there and shred papers for me for an afternoon and give him $12,000 because that's not what I would pay the market. It has to be a market-based wage and it has to, the kids gotta be at least seven years or older, but they can do a variety of things. They can, depending on what your business is. So say for my CPA firm, they can come in and reconcile bank statements. They can um, help organize some of our file structure and um, create some systems and things that we need. They can help manage social media. Um, you know, if, if uh, you would pay somebody to serve you coffee for $12,000 a year for, for the course of the year, I guess, then, then that's what it would cover. But, you know, again, it just has to be a market-based wage and go from there. Can, can you speak about 1031 exchanges on a flip uh, the, they said the code states it's not allowed, but you had talked about that as part of your example. Yeah, well, we, um, I, maybe I was a little bit liberal in what I was saying. So you, when you have a flip, if you are technically flipping property, you're no longer really in real estate. You're in the business of construction more or less. And that's what you're doing. And, and, um, and Connie is, is it Connie? She's right. You you can't exact you can't 1031 a flip. But if your fact pattern is such that this is the only deal you've ever done, and maybe you were holding that for rental at the first of it, and then let's say the market's going crazy like it was in 2020 or 21, and you decide to sell that and take advantage of the rates, then you can uh, put that into a 1031. But you can't, if you're actively flipping property, you can't defer that through a 1031 exchange. Um, and what can you do if you made the mistake of being reactive instead of proactive in your, your planning? Well, I, I, that's kind of an open-ended question. I, you know, it, it, it's always a good idea if you feel like you've paid too much in taxes to maybe go uh, see a professional that you trust or or reach out to us and they can always look back at the prior years, three years. And if there's anything that can be done to to change um, the tax return of the past and get you some more money, that that's always available to you. It's um, but I mean, the, the big thing you can do is just change the way you're operating now and, and work with somebody that can help you look at that in the future and, and start building toward being more efficient with your tax structure. 
And what is retirement income? Is that considered active, passive? Where does that fall if that's your investment? Yeah, so just, I guess we're just talking distributions from a 401k or an IRA, something like that, I would assume. It's it's really considered in long lines of active or portfolio income. It's not passive. So you can't take passive losses from real estate and offset it against uh, retirement benefits unless you're a real estate professional. Now, the thing with being retired is if you're not actively employed somewhere, you've got that time to meet that real estate professional status if you want to or you need to. Uh, Lupe is asking because she is a military pension user for her her fund. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, assuming that your Lupe doesn't look like she's retired, she's still going at it full time. So, but if if you are working elsewhere, you've got that real estate professional status you can go after. Um, and and for those of you that are GPs in these deals, you've got some you've got some opportunities here that maybe some of the LPs don't, but. It's just depends what your fact pattern is for you guys, each of if, you guys. If you're watching this from a beach in Hawaii, does that help you write off your business trip? No, it does not. <laughs> but I, I think you want to make everybody envious of this. But here's how you write that trip off to Hawaii. First off, you, you get off the beach and you go find a real estate agent. And you start hustling and you find some real estate that you're gonna buy. So writing off a vacation is, is, is possible. You just gotta be um, careful with it because you don't, wanna get, you don't wanna get stupid with the taxes and draw unnecessary attention to yourself. But let's say you went to Hawaii for a conference and um, for being a superstar real estate agent or whatever it is. Let's say you're in Honolulu for um, five days on this conference, and then you extend your trip another week to have your family come out and enjoy all the scenery out there. If you spend more than 50% of your time on that vacation in business, meaning you're in a conference, or let's say you're buying real estate and you're running around looking at different real estate, then all of a sudden you can write off the cost of that flight, the cost of the hotel, everything for the whole entire time. Just merely sitting on the beach and watching a webinar about real estate does not make your trip deductible because ideally you could be, you could be in your home in Texas or wherever you're at watching that. You don't have to be in uh, Hawaii to do that. You would have to be in Hawaii to buy real estate in Hawaii. You would have to be in Hawaii to do business in Hawaii. You would have to be in Hawaii to be in a conference. That's the difference. So I've got two more in the chat box and I'll take one more on top of that before we head out. Do you see much benefit from your real estate clients from their businesses for renting out your home once a month to your business to write that off at market value? Are monthly meeting minutes required to approve? So this is for somebody who I believe owns their own business uh, and is working out of their home. Mm. Somebody's getting some TikTok tax advice on the Augusta rule, huh? Um, so if you don't know what the Augusta rule is, it basically, it was put into play by um, some senators in Georgia to let their houses on Augusta be tax deductible for the masters because they're able to rent out their houses at a pretty extraordinary rate. What that rule states is if you rent your personal home out for 14 days or less, that income to you is tax-free. Meaning if you've got a business, that business can host an event at your house, whether it's say an employee retreat or whether it's a company function of any kind, as long as that's a market rate, um, in other words, let's say I was going to have a, an employee retreat to my house to talk about how to be the best CPA firm in the entire world. And um, let's say I build $100,000 for it. Well, could I go out to the Westin in Dallas and spend a week there and spend $100,000? Probably not. So it has to be in line with what the market would present. But it, it's, it's um, certainly, 
in play. You need to have a contract. You don't necessarily need to put it in the minutes, but what I would do is I would shop around um, your local um, hotels and see what it would cost to, to rent a conference room or, or a few rooms for a few days and then compare that back to what you can do to your house. And then let's say that's 15K. If I can get 15K out of your personal, out of your company, a deduction, get it to you personally tax-free, 37% if that's your bracket is a little over five grand. I, uh, I know I do that. Uh, once a year, I call the, the Marriott three miles from my house and say, what's your price for renting a conference room? And uh, once a month, I have a corporate retreat uh, at my house and I have it in paper or a quote for what a meeting room would cost. So I definitely recommend people who have that advantage to do it. Uh, next question here. I got the last two in the box here. When you say passive losses, what is that in reference to? Section 469, again, passive means something you are not actively involved in. So if, if you came, if Jared came to me tomorrow and said, hey, I want to invest into your CPA firm, I'm going to give you half a million dollars um, for a 25% stake. And I said, yes, but he's going to stay in San Francisco because it's too hot in Dallas to be here. And he just wants to get the returns on it. He's not actively involved in my business. So any income and or losses that my CPA firm gave to him would be passive. Well, by letter of the law, real estate is passive in the tax code. It doesn't matter what you do. It's passive because real estate doesn't take that much time to manage. The only way to make real estate not passive is if you personally can be a real estate professional, which we talked about. So passive losses can't be offset against passive income. Passive simply means you're not actively involved in that business. Hey, you. Sorry, I got muted. Um, so the next question is, we hear every real estate related expense like courses, miles, meals, education, hotel um, is deductible. Is that, uh, when is that allowed? When is that not? Just to clarify back to Hawaii. Yeah, I, well, I mean, it's, that's a little, that's a little hard to say because I don't know the fact pattern of what you've got here, but let's, it, my clients had always asked me, what can I deduct from my business? Assuming we're talking about a business. Anything you're doing to spend money to um, make more revenue or produce more in returns is most likely deductible. So there's a lot of things we can go through. So um, it needs to be reasonable. It needs to be necessary and it needs to be for the business. So you know, let's say my wife and I went to um, Bob's Steak and Chop House and spent 200 bucks on a, on a dinner, bottle of wine and steaks. Is that a tax deductible uh, event if my business pays for it? Well, if we talk about business, meaning that maybe I talk to my wife about how I can motivate my employees. She obviously is not a CPA. She doesn't know anything about tax law, but there are things that she can help me out with my business, whether it's how to motivate my employee, how to engage with my clients or how to be a better um, marketer. There's, there's advice I could get from her. If we talk about that at that meal, that's going to be a tax deduction for my business. And it's got to be reasonable. I can't go to spend $200 on a meal every single night and have $75,000 in meals um, at the end of the year. But it may be once a month or something like that. But going back to it, anything that you spend money on that's for the business, reasonable and necessary, and is going to, on down the line, give me more revenue, like talking with my wife about how to get more customers could bring me more revenue, it's most likely a tax deduction. So, so and the, the last two questions I'm combining here, and then we'll let everybody go, is... Um, Towards the 750 hours that you had talked about, do you go into conferences, do attending these webinars, do just travel time to view properties? Does that count towards that? 
you got to be careful with that. I mean, if you don't have any property, then then some of those hours may not count. But certainly, um, you know, researching deals and understanding your training can go into that. But it's um, um, you really, at the end of the day, you got to have some sort of property. In other words, if you end up the year with uh, 800 hours of just webinars and training and underwriting deals, but you got nothing to show for it, most likely those are gonna be thrown out. So great, thank you, Vince, for your time. Tiffany or Lupe, anything to, to bring us home? Um, thank you so much, Vince, for joining us tonight. And thank you for everyone um, who joined us. Guests, we'll be sending out a recording tomorrow. I think uh, we also we can add Vince's uh, contact info in our email, Vince, uh, since we didn't get a chance to get your contact here. And then we'll just include that in the email. Or if you want to drop yeah, you've got, that. Okay. If you want to take a cool. shot of that, you can let a link to my page if you want to chat with me. Perfect. We'll give everybody a minute to do to do that. Thanks for posting that. Great. Well, thank you so much, Vincent. Thank you, everybody, for, for joining us tonight. Uh, we will have another one coming up uh, next month. And if you have topic suggestions, things, people you want to hear, please email us and let us know. If you have questions about the waterways portfolio, Lupe loves to talk about that. Uh, please reach out. And thank you for your time tonight, everybody. Thank you. Have a good yeah. night. Bye. Bye.